Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of the Fundamental Health Podcast. If you are watching on YouTube, you can tell this is a Costa Rica edition, and I'm loving it here. I'm also super excited about Bone Matrix being released this week at Hardened Soil. This is our microcrystalline hydroxy appetite bone matrix with calcium, boron, manganese, strontium, bovine active A, all kinds of good stuff in there. As you heard in my controversial thoughts earlier this week, this is like the Elaine dance. As you heard in my controversial thoughts earlier this week, calcium, I think, is an important thing to have on your diet, regardless of whether it's carnivore, animal-based, or whatever. Definitely, if you don't have a uh, dairy source of calcium in your diet, check us out at Hardened Soil for Bone Matrix. Check us out at hardensoil.co if you need other organs in your diet as well. You're going to hear a lot about that in this AMA, the importance of fat-soluble nutrients, which come from liver and organs, all kinds of good stuff there. Enjoy this. Uh, enjoy all these supplements from us and reclaim your ancestral birthright to radical health with heart and soil with these desiccated organ supplements, heartandsoil.co. And I hope you guys will enjoy this AMA podcast. This is an Ask Me Anything. This is the third Ask Me Anything. You can go to the Learn tab at heartandsoil.co and pull down that and search for any of the questions you have. It'll all be indexed there. There will be uh, show notes that show you what questions I've answered in this podcast, and I hope it will be helpful. There are three. So I've answered a lot of questions between those three Ask Me Anythings, and this one continues to add to the growing library. In the Learn tab at hardensoil.co, you can find answers to almost every question you guys have. There's questions about blue zones, does meat cause cancer, LDL, blood work. I've answered all this stuff already, but I try and go into a little more depth on some of that in this Ask Me Anything. If you like this podcast, if you like fundamental health, if you appreciate what I'm doing, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It's how we spread the message about this, how we reach more people, how we help more people reclaim their ancestral birthright to radical health. If you guys heard last week's episode with Anthony Gustin, I went to uh, Tanzania, got to spend time with the Hadza and saw that so many of the things that we really believe to be true are being played out in real hunter-gatherer cultures. The Hadza are some of the last hunter-gatherers left on the planet, and they too favor meat and organs. That's why we do it. We do it hard in soil. That's why we do what we do with this podcast. It's the message that I think more and more people need to hear, that the way that humans can be healthy, healthiest, thrive, reclaim that ancestral birthright to radical health is by eating the majority of your diet as meat and organs and the least toxic plant foods. That's the idea of an animal-based diet. Carnivore is great. Animal-based is probably going to help a lot more people get major improvements in their overall health. So please leave me a review at Apple Podcasts. Every month I give away a signed copy of the book to one person who's left me a review at Apple Podcasts. Thank you, you guys who've left reviews. And at the first podcast in March, which will be probably next week's podcast, I will be sharing the name of the winner of the um, signed copy of the book for the month of February. So please get those reviews in. Thanks for supporting it. All right, you guys, on to the AMA podcast, the Ask Me Anything podcast. If you have questions that you would like to submit for the AMA podcast in the future, you can always email me, Dr. Paul, drpaul, hardensoil.co. You know what we do. We help you reclaim your ancestral birthright to radical health. We help you kick some ass. And I got to go surfing this morning. It wasn't very good, but it was still good to be in the ocean. So thanks for leaving your view on Apple Podcasts. Love you all. On to the podcast. I wore a shirt for this one. You don't get the shirtless podcast for the whole thing, but talk to you soon. Stay radical. All right, you guys, here we go. Ask Me Anything podcast, Costa Rica edition. If you are watching on YouTube, you will see that the background is different than normal. There's a sunrise going on behind me. There's a bird over there. The audio is less than optimal. I apologize for that, but hopefully the situation and the surroundings make up for it. So I'm going to jump into the first ask me anything question with the caveat that if you guys have questions you would like to add for a future AMA podcast, you can always email me, drpaul, drpaul, heartandsoil.co. I have a list, I have a big document that I have compiled and every 
few weeks, how every so often as you guys would like it, I will be doing more of these AMA podcasts. I enjoy them and I think it helps answer questions that are common in the community. I will say that as I start this podcast, many of these questions are repeat questions. I will answer them and <clears throat> they've been asked before. I'm gonna try and get to the new ones, but if you have questions that you think I may have asked in the past, go to heartandsoil.co. Under the Learn tab, there is a search bar there for videos and podcasts. I've done previous AMA podcasts. This is the third one, and you can search all those things. Say, for instance, you have questions about blood work, or you have questions about the blue zones, or you have questions about LDL, you can search all of my material at heartandsoil.co under the Learn tab, and you'll find answers to almost all of it there already. Um, so hopefully that helps. Certainly if you email me, I will try and respond and point to the links that have already been done to answer these questions. I feel I've answered almost all of them in the past. Happy to do it again. But if you're wanting to do that a little more expediently, you can go directly to heartandsoil.co and check that stuff out. While you're there, you can grab some notes to tell nutrition. If you need more of that in your life, as I said in the intro, we just released Bone Matrix. I did a whole Ask Me, excuse, I did a whole Controversial Thoughts podcast last week about the importance of calcium on a carnivore diet and the benefits of microcrystalline hydroxy appetite. So please refer back to that one if you are interested in that topic. All right, first question from Joseph Amos. Joseph says, I've been so fortunate to follow your carnivore diet and your heart and soil supplements and have seen incredible results so far. I'm a physician in Houston, what's up Texas, and practice pain medicine. A big push for me to make this change was for me to optimize my health, but also how can I integrate this into my practice for my patients? Some of the questions I have are, what are the best lab work baselines to measure and then remeasure and gauge progress? So let's address that. And then I'll go to the rest of Joseph's questions. Joseph's questions. So you guys will know I've done two podcasts on blood work. And again, you can go to heartandsoil.co you can search under the Learn tab and you will see these podcasts. Specifically, I pulled one up for you. This is a controversial thoughts video I did on blood work on a carnivore diet. You can see up here in the top right is the Learn tab. You can always click on that, see podcasts and videos and go to the search feature and type in something like blood work and you will see here are the videos. So you can check out this video, which blood work I would order on a car on a carnivore diet or on an animal-based diet. I've also done a recent podcast with Sean O'Mara in which we talked about the importance of or the value of something like MRI, specifically cross-sectional MRI, to look at visceral fat. So Joseph, the main labs I would order are in that blood work video that I've done, but they are the basic stuff. CBC, Comprehensive Metabolic Panel, CBC stands for um, complete blood count. I would get an iron panel because you want to make sure that somebody's ferritin and transferrin saturation are normal. And you want to get a fasting insulin. That's something I've talked about a lot. An HSCRP. You want to make sure you also get some basic thyroid labs, even more comprehensive thyroid labs, TSH, free T3, free T4 antibodies. You want to get a 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And I would add to that things like coenzyme Q10. I would add to that some nutrients. You definitely want to see somebody's serum folate, their homocysteine to make sure you're not missing anything there. Get a lipid panel. It doesn't have to be a complex lipid panel. A NMR lipoprotein panel would be more interesting perhaps, but really you just get a lipid panel to look at their HDL and triglycerides. You can almost completely ignore the LDL number if they are metabolically healthy, as I've discussed at length in the past. And to that, I would add something like a CGM. I would add a continuous glucose monitor from a company like Nutrisense.io. I did a whole podcast on my continuous blood glucose monitor testing in the past. You can look at that. That was when I had done a few months of experimentation with carbohydrates. You can see that despite eating honey twice a day, I did not develop insulin resistance with, uh, according to my CGM, nor according to my labs, my fasting insulin stayed very, very low. And I would get a measure of visceral adipose tissue. The cheapest, easiest way is a DEXA scan that's longitudinal. And a better way is with an MRI that's cross-sectional. So they're both pretty accurate, but you can monitor visceral fat. I think that visceral fat monitoring is going to give people a much better indication and much more motivation to change their health. And as I talked about in the podcast with Sean O'Mara, which you can find from in the past, 
you can see changes over the course of a week when somebody has gone off a diet. Obviously, I think an animal-based diet that eliminates seed oils is going to be the way to go. Focus on meat, focus on organs, and include the least toxic plant foods. And I think that'll make the diet much more sustainable for your patients. Now, I will say that based on my experience, working as a physician assistant in cardiology for four years, and then as a physician with clients, you can't make people change. They have to come to you. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So you know this with your patients. And this will segue into another question that I will answer momentarily, but I think that for all of us, when we experience the benefits of an animal-based diet, we often want to tell people about it. We want to tell our friends. We want to tell our family. And that doesn't always work well because it's very challenging to convince someone of something that they don't even really know they need in the first place. My experience is you show them, you don't tell them. With your own example of energy, vigor, vitality, strength, libido, sleep, mental clarity, you will be a beacon of hope to your patients and to your friends and family who will ask you, what the heck are you doing? You look great. Your skin looks good. Your eyes are clear. You're so mentally sharp. What are you doing with your body? It looks great. And that is when you can share the message of what you're actually doing. But until people ask, until they give you the lead in, humans are not really going to be open to change. But as a physician doing pain medicine, I think that if you are the example, Joseph, your patients will follow. So Joseph goes on to say, I know in some of your podcasts, you mentioned continuous glucose monitoring, as well as individual labs looking at disease process. So we talked about those. In essence, I'm very big on metrics and data and want to incorporate the carnivore diet in my recommendations for patients. That's great. I would also recommend, Joseph, that you think about including an animal-based diet because it's going to be much more sustainable long-term. You want to measure, but he wants to measure their progress and optimization. So we talked about all those things and I think we answered Joseph's question. So the one thing I will say here, you guys have all heard this in the past, but in case there's any newbies out there, an animal-based diet, in my opinion, is very similar to a carnivore diet, but it starts to look more like our hunter-gatherer ancestors. It includes some of the least toxic plant foods. It's based on meat and organs, just like the Hadza base their diet around. That's all they think about is meat and organs and hunting. And when they can get the least toxic plant foods, which are generally fruit and occasional tubers, which they mostly spit out. If you heard the podcast last week with Anthony Gustin, they don't have much fiber in their diet. Justin Sonnenberg is wrong about this. He probably didn't even go to see the Hadza. I think many people make claims about the Hadza based on papers and they've never actually been there. They have a very low fiber diet actually because <laughs> the tubers there are so fibrous you can't even spit them out. So I thought that was so interesting to see when I was there that ancestral tubers, things we evolved with as humans, look nothing like sweet potatoes or potatoes, not starchy. These are all hybridized things that are much more starchy than usual. Certainly simple sugars are available in nature like honey and berries and fruit, but starches not so much. Uh, it's much more rare than we've been led to believe, and it's mostly based on hybridized vegetables, hybridized roots specifically. Listen to the podcast with Anthony Gustin from last week if you want to hear all about the trip to Tanzania with the Hadza. I've got a part two coming as well. But an animal-based diet is going to be based on meat and organs and the least toxic plant foods, which I believe are generally fruit. Now, sometimes there are fruits that we think of as vegetables like avocado or squash, but they're actually fruit. They're bearing the seeds they're part of the plant's efforts to move their seeds around. But I am certainly not someone, and I will talk about this later in the podcast, who believes that, quote, sugar from fruit is bad for humans. I think we should welcome that into our diet in moderate amounts. Obviously, don't eat it to the extreme at the exclusion of more nutrient-rich foods. But myself and so many people I've talked to do so much better on an animal-based diet than a carnivore diet long-term. In fact, I met a guy here in Santa Teresa, shout out to Tom, who even said that his carnivore diet was great. And then he just ran into all sorts of problems, the electrolytes and energy crashes. Long-term ketosis does not work for many humans. There's probably a genetic basis underlying this, but for a lot of people, don't be so dogmatic with your carnivore or animal-based diet that you're not willing to include some carbohydrates. And even if they're simple carbohydrates, that's fine. Raw, organic, local honey, preferentially seasonal fruit. In Costa Rica, I've been really enjoying local seasonal fruit and finding it works really well for me in general. So that's the answer to the question, what an animal-based diet is. There is a infographic you can get if you join us for Animal Based 30. We're gonna be doing another one in April, most likely. You can always email me, drpaul at heartandsoil.co if you have questions about that. On to the next question. 
Next question is from Rebecca Elder. She says, obviously we can't make people change their life if they're not looking to change it. My question for you is how do you think someone like me who is not an MD can go about trying to expose these bad ideas about the nutrition standards set for the general public in America today? Great question, challenging question. This is one of the reasons that I try and provide you guys with studies and research to back these things up. But I hear from people all the time, I'm talking to my friends and they're saying this or they're saying that. And you all are experiencing the benefits of an animal-based diet and you wanna share it with people in your life. And so how do you go about doing this? The first thing, as I mentioned to Joseph earlier, was be an example. If you are feeling good on this diet, show them, don't tell them. They'll see it and they'll ask you questions and then they'll have curiosity. If you get into discussions with people and they're asking questions or they're saying, everyone knows X, Y, Z. Usually it's everyone knows meat is bad for you or everyone knows that vegetables are good for you. I like to ask people questions and understand how deeply they appreciate this material because most of the time they are actually parroting information that they have heard, but they don't really know the scientific basis for it. So ask them questions. Ask them, why do you think that? What studies are you looking at to support that notion, to buttress that notion? Most of the time they're epidemiology. Most of the time they're observational studies that don't have any real basis in scientific experiment, in which case you may need to explain to them, hmm, you're using an observational epidemiology study to make this claim, but you know those are really flawed and there are many observational epidemiology studies that counter contradict or counteract the results of this one you're looking at. Let's look at some interventional studies, shall we? And then you can use interventional studies that I have looked at or shown and actually show them. There are interventional studies that show, number one, meat is not bad for you. In fact, it's very good for you. I've shown this multiple times. Number two, vegetables are not the panacea or fountain of youth or magical thing that we've been told they are. And number three, there are lots of mechanistic studies that show that plants have defense chemicals. So why are we doing this? Number four, there's lots of studies that show that fiber is not the fountain of youth or magic for your poop or any part of you. And number six, five, I lost count because there's so many here. There are key nutrients in animal foods that we just can't get in plant foods. I'll be talking about coenzyme Q10 a little later in this podcast. So I think this is a reiteration of one of the things I told Joseph, which was show them, don't tell them, and have the studies backing you up and understand that most of your friends are thinking about epidemiology and you may need to disabuse them of the notion that epidemiology is really that valuable. Um, Rebecca goes on to say, I wanna help people see the scientific evidence you're putting out there and see people be receptive to it, but it is hard, <laughs> especially when I'm doing this diet and finding it to be difficult to afford all the pasture raised meat. Nonetheless, I find it close to this area. I'm dedicated to it and find it to be overwhelming. What can I do to affect some change? I like that you have the means to provide resources such as your supplements and referrals to farms that can ship these quality meats. However, people get turned off by the expense of it all. So the expense is something that comes up frequently. And I think this is an interesting idea to consider. If your friends are turned off by the expense of it all, I would ask them, what are you spending on your plant foods? Because when I was a vegan, or even when I was paleo, I was spending just as much money on kale and collard greens and broccoli, most of which went to waste. Meat is not wasted by humans. We know evolutionarily meat is good for us, but there is a huge amount of waste from plants and vegetables that people are buying. If people are buying junk food, then they're not ready for change in general. But if people are making intentional choices with regard to their diet, they're probably already spending more money on plant foods that have less nutritional value. Now, if people are not willing to spend money on their health, there's, it's very difficult to convince them of the, the end goal here or to actually give them this information because health takes investment. Good things are hard. Good things take investment of our resources, whether it's time, money, attention, et cetera. So if people want a cheap option that's healthy, I suppose they don't have to do grass-fed, grass-finished meat. It's better for the planet. It's gonna be less toxic in my opinion. It's certainly the right answer, but they could start with just regular meat I don't think those people are terribly committed to their health and may need more convincing or may need to see more of an example in the, in your life or in someone else's life. So the financial thing, I think there's plenty of ways to do it affordably. Our supplements are not that expensive. It's probably less than a dollar a day for most people to get organs this way. You can buy fresh liver. It's very cheap. You can get suet usually for free. You can get ground hamburger. I definitely think you can eat a carnivore animal based diet for around $15 a day. If somebody doesn't have $15 a day to spend on their health, then 
there may be other options they can do to help prioritize. Maybe they can work at a food share. Maybe they need to work at a farm. Maybe they can share food with someone else, like a cow share or something. But the financial thing is solvable. It just depends on someone's actual resolve with regard to this. On to the next question. Alex Emery asks if I could do a podcast with Zach Bush. I would love to. I reached out to Zach through Aubrey. Um, haven't heard back from him yet. We'll keep working on it. I want to believe that Zach is open-minded. He's definitely more plant-based. I think there would be some healthy discussion there and I'll see if we can work on it. Alex also asks about a supplement that Zach promotes, which has terahydrate in it and asks for my comments. So this supplement is for the gut and I think that it's on the right track, but I also think it's quite redundant. Um, I don't think you need to get dirt in your water. I think you can just get exposed to dirt in your environment. And that's essentially what Zach's supplement is. No disrespect to Zach, but terahydrate is a fancy name for humic and fulvic acids, which are found in dirt. <laughs> End of story. I don't think there's anything magic about this terahydrate that Zach is putting in his supplement. I do think these things are beneficial for the human gut. And as we'll see later, I'll answer some questions about the gut in general. And I think we should be getting exposed to dirt. If you guys listen to the podcast today with Anthony Gustin, or you have seen in the material there, you will have known, you will know that when we were eating tubers, so we actually dug tubers with the women and we ate the tubers. So you peel the skin off the tuber and my hands are full of dirt because I've been digging in the dirt and there's dirt all over this tuber that I'm eating. It's not very sweet. It's actually quite mild. It's kind of nice and refreshing. There's some water in it, but it doesn't really feel like there's many calories. And I immediately have to spit out the fiber because it's so freaking fibrous, but I'm definitely getting exposed to a lot of dirt. When I was in Tanzania, I got exposed to so much dirt. When Anthony got his tummy ache, tummy ache, and when I got my tummy ache later on, they gave us roots from a plant to chew on. And we did as medicine, because I believe plants can be useful as a medicine temporarily, but not so much as food, at least the vegetable parts of plants as food. And the, the roots have dirt on them. You heard this story in the podcast I did with Anthony about this, but hunter gatherers are exposed to dirt. Humans are exposed to dirt always. The question is, how do you get clean dirt? So maybe if you can't get clean dirt, a terahydrate supplement, a humic acid, fulvic acid supplement might be good. But to me, this just begs the question, why are you not exposed to good dirt? If you're living in a city and you can't get good dirt, get into the wilderness. This is a key part of what humans need. Even if you live in New York City, you need to get out in the woods. And if you're in the woods, just stick your hand in the dirt and eat a little bit. You're gonna be fine. You really won't get a parasite. You won't have any problems. <clears throat> Bring a filter from MSR, Mountain Safety Research, like I did to to Costa Rica and Africa, filter some of that river water. If you're in a nice wilderness area, filter some forest water, drink some forest water. You'll, you'll get these little, um, these little molecules that are beneficial for you. This is what humans have always been doing. I strongly believe that the Hadza gut is not quote healthy, is not diverse because of the fiber they're eating because they're not really eating much fiber. It's because of their environment. And this is the part that's been lost because you can't package it in a pill and nobody can sell it to you. I guess Zach is trying and it's, an, it's a laudable effort, but I think that the easier, cheaper, simpler, more evolutionarily consistent way is just go in nature, get dirty. Don't wash the dirt out from under your fingernails and eat a meal. You'll be fine and you'll get humic and fulvic acids. So I think that this terahydrate supplement is a lot of hype. It's overrated. I'll talk to Zach about it when he comes on the podcast, but I do think there's benefit to humic and fulvic acids. And I think that it means we need to get into nature as humans. You need, you deserve wilderness. This is what you need as a human being. I'm in Costa Rica, I'm surfing, I'm getting exposed to all sorts of things here. This is how we're supposed to live. And if we get so reductionist and remove ourselves from nature, we really can't hack it in a reductionist way. You deserve to be back in nature, whether it's sunlight, Shinrin Yoku, forest bathing, breathing these things from plants. This is what we need. And you can't hack it. You can't hack it. We're supposed to be in nature as humans. This is part of the remembering. So that is my answer to that one. But hopefully I'll get Zach on the podcast soon and we can have some friendly discussion about why he thinks plant-based is the way to go. I just don't get it. He's definitely an advocate for regenerative agriculture and I support him on that. Before I move on from this topic, I wanna to show you guys an article. We shared a bunch in the podcast with Anthony. The gut microbiome of Hodson Hunter Gatherers is here. You can see they don't even include, they don't even have bifidobacteria generally very healthy. They have a much higher level of microbial richness and biodiversity than Italian cohorts, but it's not because of fiber. It's 
because of their exposure to dirt and nature. So you can see they have Prevotella, Treponema, unclassified Bacteroidetes. Here's a cat. That's what happens in Costa Rica. It's real life, you guys, on the podcast. Um, they have a peculiar arrangement of Clostridialis taxa and may enhance the ability to digest and extract valuable nutrition from fibrous plant foods. Well, that's bullshit. They don't really eat the fibrous plant foods. They spit them out. But it may be that way because they're so much more exposed to dirt in their environment. So what's the take home here? If you want a healthy gut, it may actually be as simple or as evolutionarily consistent as get in nature. Get your butt in nature. Be in the sun, be in the ocean, be in lakes and rivers, filter your water from those. Don't get Giardia, don't get Cryptosporidium, but eat a little bit of dirt from wilderness sources. That sounds very simple, I know, but I think that that is the key for many of us. On to the next question. So Brenton Campbell asks, keen to know your thoughts on Candida, Candida, and wondering if you could talk about it when you're next, when you're on your next internet waves. Uh, interested to know how would it interact with the carnivore diet? Would it die off or become dormant on the carnivore diet? What tests would you test for? Time frames around maybe reintroducing some non-toxic carbohydrates. So I think can, candida, candida is a funny topic. I hear people pronounce it all over the place. I always say candida. People say candida. You say tomato, I say tomato. Neither of us eats it because it's a nightshade vegetable. Actually, it's a nightshade fruit, but it's still not good for you, in my opinion. Very immunologically triggering. The paradigm around candida is overly simplified, in my opinion. And I thought this was a good question to segue from because it thinks about the gut as well. When people get candida, they often are told, go off your sugars, go off your carbohydrates because it feeds the yeast. Yes and no. What usually happens in these people is the candida may go down, but as soon as they reintroduce carbohydrates, which is essentially inevitable for most people, because I don't think many people thrive on long-term ketogenic diets, as I've discussed in the past, the candida comes back. The candida comes back. And people say, what's going on? And you can't get rid of candida with bombing it with anti-candidals. I've seen it time and time again in my patients, whether you take fluconazole, which is iflucan or nystatin, it's not as simple as using an antimicrobial or an antifungal. It's terrain, it's an ecosystem. Think of your gut as nodes on a spider web. And all of these microorganisms, whether they're fungal, eukaryotic, or bacterial, prokaryotic, have interactions. It's more about the community. The community has to police itself. You can't just go in and use an antifungal and get rid of candida, candida, because as soon as you stop the antifungal, it's going to come back because there's a niche. There's a node in the ecosystem web where that candida can grow. You need to have other microorganisms and a node and a community that's going to police itself. This is why these antifungals, antibacterials generally don't work and why I don't favor using antimicrobials, antifungals, antibacterial things in the gut, generally speaking. Occasionally, if somebody has a very pathogenic organism, and to me, the histolytica, a worm, like a tapeworm or something, a bad parasite. Yes, I think an antibacterial or even herbal treatments, which are less effective, could be indicated. But generally speaking, for dysbiosis, I don't see antimicrobial herbs working that well. I don't see antifungals working that well for fungal overgrowth like candida. And I don't think removing carbohydrates is the long-term solution. What is the long-term solution? I believe it's working on the whole community, the whole microbiome. And how do you do that? You change your lifestyle. You basically go to Tanzania. You don't have to go to Tanzania in reality, but you go to Tanzania and figuratively, metaphorically, and you get in the dirt and you understand what is missing, which microorganisms are missing from your gut in that ecosystem. So if you wanted to test for it, there are lots of tests to tell you if you have candida. I don't think all of them are great or accurate. There's um, GI map, there's GI effects from Genova. But generally speaking, you probably know if you have candidal symptoms, you have it's an itchy butt, <laughs> you might have reactions to uh, sugary foods, but it's more complex than simply antifungals and antibacterials. It always recurs. And you need to be able to have carbohydrates in your diet. Carbohydrates don't cause candida. Candida. 
because there are lots of people, myself included, who eat lots of carbohydrates. Yesterday I had honey, then I had some tropical fruit, not a ton, but I had maybe 150, 100 grams of carbohydrates in addition to my meat and organs. I don't have candida. I don't have a candidal overgrowth. So we equate these things and people say, oh, including carbohydrates in your diet worsens candida. Therefore, carbohydrates cause it, right? It's an overly simplified paradigm. As you'll see in the, when I answer the next question about what makes Egyptians fat and Michael Ede's perspective on this. Just because carbohydrates are associated there doesn't mean they're problematic or actually causing the problem in all people. The association is not causation. We keep making this error of judgment, even in people in the ketogenic community who claim to understand that we cannot draw causative inference from observational things. So look around. There are lots of people who eat carbohydrates who don't have candidal overgrowth, okay? It doesn't cause it. Can it worsen it? Perhaps. Is removing the carbohydrates a good first step? Possibly. What is the long-term solution? It is understanding why your microbiome is disordered. Did you have a course of antibiotics? Are you doing something else that is messing up your microbiome? Are you having a toxin in your diet? Do you have a lot of chlorine or fluoride in your water? What are you doing that is messing up your microbiome? How do you get it back? I think that the key, which is really low tech, is getting into freaking nature. I talked about this with Tommy Wood. Eat some good dirt. Drink some water from springs. You can try and take a probiotic. I don't think they work really well long-term. It's not going to hurt you. I've done multiple episodes on probiotics in the past with Michael Ruscio, et cetera. But the solution is deeper than just removing carbohydrates for candida, okay? It's changing your whole lifestyle. It's getting enough sun, getting enough nutrients, making sure the gut is not damaged, removing lectins, getting nose to tail nutrients, getting the things into your diet that are important to make it. It's a holistic thing. This is why we just have struggled so much to recreate the microbiome because it's how you live. It's how you live your whole life. You can't just do it with a probiotic and not change something else in your life. You can't just remove carbohydrates and not change anything else in your life because it won't get better. And you'll just be chasing your tail over and over. You have to change your whole lifestyle. And I think a lot of that is getting some good dirt, getting some good spring water, removing things that are messing up your gut, removing foods that are problematic, removing foods that are damaging to your gut lining, removing foods that are messing up your microbiome. And these are not carbohydrates, especially not real carbohydrates, quote unquote, like fruit or honey. Honey could even be a beneficial thing because of all the other compounds in honey. I actually want to show you guys an interesting study on honey that I came across the other day. Um, it's something I get more and more interested in all the time. So the point of this one is just to say that in some people, including honey, might improve candida. And it's certainly for oral fungal overgrowth and oral mucositis, as I've showed in the past, real honey can be beneficial. So this is a really cool study. Natural honey lowers plasma glucose, C-reactive protein, homocysteine, and blood lipids in healthy diabetic and hyperlipidemic subjects. It's a comparison with dextrose and sucrose. So, so often in the ketogenic communities, it really grinds my gears that people want to conflate honey with pure sugar. And in my own mind, I've been trying to really puzzle this out and understand what is the difference here? Obviously, honey is a much more complex food. There are many more compounds in honey, which appear to have effects in the human body. As I talked about on Joe Rogan's podcast, there are experiments in mice that show very different physiologic effects in, with honey versus pure dextrose and sucrose. But here is a cool study in humans, which shows exactly the same thing. So you can read here, um, honey compared with dextrose and sucrose caused lower elevation of PGL in diabetics. PGL is, what is the acronym they're looking at here? Plasma glucose level, that makes sense. But you can see in this paper, which is a fascinating to read, that they compared real honey to sham honey. And there's a lot of sham honey out there. That's honey that has been enriched with high fructose corn syrup. You don't want that, which is why I'm a fan of local raw organic honey. Preferably, you can just go to Tanzania and eat some honey out of the tree with the Hadza. That's the best way. But it's so fascinating that these things move our body in different directions. I continue to believe that whole food, and this is going to sound passe, whole food is really where it's at, that our body reacts differently to processing of foods in certain ways at a genetic level, at an epigenetic level, and that honey is something that our ancestors have always had in their diet. There's clear evidence that it doesn't cause tooth decay, that it actually promotes healing of so many things. I've talked about this research multiple times in the past and showed many studies with regard to this. 
And I think it's a valuable food in the human diet if you choose to include it. If you are diabetic, maybe don't include honey. <laughs> if you have active metabolic syndrome, if you have active glucose intolerance, a low carbohydrate diet is going to be great in addition to the removal of seed oils. You must do that as well. And the ketogenic folks forget this, but do not forget that this is all contextual. Removal of carbohydrates is very helpful in the short term for people with metabolic dysfunction and diabetes. I do not believe that carbohydrates caused the metabolic function, dysfunction, and diabetes in the first place. I think it was a long process originally sparked by inappropriate levels of seed oils in the diet, as we'll talk about in a moment. So that's a long-winded answer to the question of candida, candida. I don't think carbohydrates caused it. The removal can be helpful in the short term, but it's not going to be a long-term fix. You must figure out what's going on with your gut. You must repopulate the gut by living well. We talked about all the ways to do that. All right, on to the next question. All right, Steve Mark asks, one thing I've been struggling with is explaining why the ancient Egyptians had such poor health and some of the same problems that people in our modern society do. Reference Dr. Michael Eads talks. There's a great talk by Dr. Michael Eads, though I disagree with some parts of it, Paleoanthropology and the Origins of Modern Disease on YouTube that you guys can check out. This Steve Mark goes on to say, the low-carb people blame it on the high-carb diet of the day. But I'm trying to put it together with what Chris Kenobi and Tucker Goodrich, et cetera, are saying about seed oils being the culprit, and their graphs are very compelling. Steve Mark says the ancient Egyptians didn't have seed oils. That's wrong. Actually, they did. And Michael Eads shows that in his talk, and I'll show you why. And yet they still had problems. To me, the most reasonable explanation is that the Egyptians, it's not so much that they ate a lot of carbs, but they mostly ate only carbs, probably didn't get enough nutrition from animals, et cetera, et cetera. Are the problems with human diet, the sad one, that just that it's nutrient deficiency, but people don't realize it, et cetera? So this is a great question. And I watched all of Michael Eads' talk in preparation for this. There's another talk from the guy from what I've learned, blaming Egyptian chronic health issues on their carbohydrates. And I think this is, again, this is the same error of judgment that we keep making in terms of observational studies. So what was the diet of the ancient? Let's just back up one second. Ancient Egyptians are fascinating. There is evidence of their diet based on stable isotope analysis, which I'll show you guys in a moment. And there is evidence of their diet based on historical accounts. They were not as healthy as their predecessors. In fact, they were almost completely agrarian. They had small amounts of meat in their diet, but most of their diet was wheat and grains. So people from the low carb communities, again, I think well-intentioned people who are overly zealous point to this and say, aha, the ancient Egyptians couldn't have had seed oils 5,000 years ago. They had carbs. Clearly all these carbohydrates were causing problems in humans. Now, I am no advocate for wheat. I think that wheat is a problem. Getting the majority of your nutrition from bread and wheat-based carbohydrates is a horrible idea. It's incredibly nutrient deficient and it's not going to lead to good health for any human out there on the planet. However, I continue to believe that carbohydrates do not cause diabetes or chronic disease per se. I observed this when I was in Africa as well with Anthony Gustin. There were Datoga tribes people who were eating a lot of corn. Now, corn is nutritionally bereft, but as much as it goes against everything we've all been taught to say this, I don't know that the corn itself is causing the problem as much as the lack of nutrients by feeding people corn. Wheat is a little bit of a different problem because of the lectins, because of specifically gluten, which I think there's very good evidence, opens tight junctions in all humans' guts. Now, the Egyptians were eating an ancient wheat. Was it the same? Perhaps not. So if we discard the gluten and the lectin ideas with wheat, calling it an ancient wheat for the Egyptians, I don't think the carbohydrates were the main cause of their problems. I think it was a combination of the fact that they actually did have seed oils, which is something that I've heard very few in the dogmatic spheres admit to, and the fact that they were nutrient deficient because of their reliance on so many grains in their diet. We've seen this over and over and over, that when you make a diet, particularly grain-based, you run into problems because of nutrient deficits. Now, it's also important to note that the Egyptians smoked and drank. So there are many problems. They also probably had higher levels of heavy metals, as Michael Leeds noticed, noticed notes bleh, in his talk. They used sand to grind into the bread, and so they're using a lot of dirt in their foods. Now, there are many reasons they could have had higher levels of heavy metals as well, uh, and we can look into that in the future. But let me point out a few things that I found interesting. 
along these lines. So this is a study comparing nutrition and health. It's a case study in agriculturists and hunter-gatherer populations. And this is great. It's by Cassidy. Um, it's a little bit hard to find the PDF, but when you look at this, what you find is that when you compare hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists, I looked at similar groups of people in the Ohio River Spoon Valley in my, uh, in my book and in previous discussions. The hunter-gatherers are much healthier. The agriculturalists have many more incidents of dental caries, bone problems, parotid hyperostosis, in their brain, in their, excuse me, in their skull, which is a sponge form change in the skull due to nutrient deficiencies, all kinds of issues in terms of hunter-gatherer uh, populations being much healthier than agriculturalists. We know that the transition to agriculture causes many problems for humans. Now, this is probably due to a nutrient deficiency rather than the carbohydrate itself. And the reason I would say that, if you go back to the podcast I done with Chris Kenobi, is that there are many populations of people who eat a moderate or large amount of carbohydrates in their diet who don't have chronic disease as long as they're getting enough nutrients from animals to counteract the potential deficiency, right? As long as they're getting meat and organs and eating nose to tail. Furthermore, I want to highlight the fact that hunter-gatherers have less famine than agriculturalists. So this is actually a very interesting paper that echoes something that the Hadza told us when we were in Africa, which was in response to the question, why don't you farm? There are Datoga, the there are Maasai who are pastoralists right around the Hadza. In fact, they're encroaching on their lands. And the Hadza realize that if you are a pastoralist, if you are an agriculturalist, you are subject to the whims of nature. And if there's a dry year, you are going to starve. The animals are still going to find water in watering holes and hunters persist, but agriculturalists starve. So as that study would suggest, hunter-gatherers have less famine than agriculturalists. Another advocate, right? another reason to be a hunter-gatherer, another reason that the Hadza show significant wisdom remaining as hunter-gatherers and not following in the footsteps of those around them. Now, this study was interesting as well. Earliest evidence of dental caries um, and exploitation of starchy plant foods in Pleistocene hunter-gatherers from Morocco. So, Again, if you listen to the podcast that it was Stephen Lynn, which is why it's so cool to be able to do these podcasts and connect all these dots, it's not the carbohydrates that are causing cavities. It's the absence of enough fat-soluble vitamins. But you can see here when these Moroccan, um, they call them hunter-gatherers, but they were really mostly gatherers, were subsisting mostly on acorns, they developed cavities. Is it the acorns causing cavities? No, it's not. And we've seen that because myself, others in the community, other hunter-gatherer populations that include carbohydrates like the Hadza don't have cavities. It's the absence of fat-soluble nutrients. This is why we do what we do at Hard and Soil, guys. Because your family, you, your kids need vitamin A, they need choline, they need fat-soluble nutrients from liver and organs. The podcast with Stephen Lynn was one of my favorites ever because we just really were able to connect the dots with teeth and overall human health. And the biggest take home from me there was that when you have enough fat soluble vitamins, when you have vitamin K2, when you have vitamin A, when your immune system works properly, the odontoblasts, the immune cells in your teeth control the amount of decay. But if you don't have those fat soluble nutrients, you are going to get tooth decay. I saw this when I was a vegan. I thought it was from all the fruit, except I still eat some fruit now. I still eat some honey now, and I don't have cavities. I don't have any problems with my teeth now, but when I was a vegan, I did because I was fat soluble vitamin deficient. And people would say, well, you're eating lots of carrots. Didn't that give you enough vitamin A? No, that's beta carotene. That's not gonna be converted to retinol or retinoic acid specifically, which is the usable form of vitamin A. This is why we need meat and organs. So go back to the podcast with Stephen Lynn if you have questions about what actually causes tooth decay the take home there is that it is an absence, a dearth, a deficiency of fat soluble nutrients. Do you think the Egyptians were getting enough fat soluble nutrients? No way. Do you think these Moroccan hunter gatherers, mostly gatherers, were getting enough fat soluble nutrients? No way. They were mostly eating acorns. It's not the carbohydrates that cause the tooth decay or the decline in human health. It's the absence of other nutrients. And in the case of the Egyptians, as we'll see, it's also seed oils. So I found it so interesting that, that people in the community have repeatedly tried to claim the Egyptians didn't have seed oils, but right in his talk, 
Michael Eads, who's a great guy. I should get him on the podcast. It would be a fantastic show. Even admits and shows in one of his slides, they had seed oils in the Egyptian diet. So, and it makes sense because they were pressing things. They were making seed oils. So this is a slide directly from Michael Eads talk. The ancient Egyptian diet, primarily carbohydrates, bread, fruit, vegetables, honey. Oh, oils, olive, flaxseed, safflower, sesame. Those are seed oils. And this is from C. Allred's The Egyptians. You can find the reference there. So it's clear. And there's other references that show the same thing. The Egyptians had seed oils. In fact, the Egyptians were probably some of the first people to include seed oils in their diet. How ironic is that? And as Dr. Eads appropriately correctly points out in his talk, the men looked horrible. <laughs> they had man boobs. They had obesity. So what am I saying here? I think it is a combination of inadequate nutrition, lack of enough animal products in the diet, and the inclusion of actual seed oils in the human diet for the first time in our history, or one of the first times in our history, that led to the massive amounts of, well, the apparent increased amounts of chronic disease in these Egyptians. Here's another website, kind of the same thing. Fish and oil, there were a number of different oils and fat used in the preparation of food. We know of beef, goat, and other fats. And the Egyptian language had 21 different names for vegetable oils obtained from sesame, sesame castor oil, flaxseed, radish seed, horseradish, safflower, and colocynth. This is from, who knows what the, the attribution of this website is. This is the diet of ancient Egyptians right? At tourEgypt.net, but another site that suggests that the ancient Egyptians had seed oils. And then one more, this study, if you look at it, the production of vegetable oils in the world and in ancient Egypt, an overview, talks about the current production of seed oils in Egypt. They're significant, but also corroborates the notion that ancient Egypt had seed oils in their diet. So I think the notion is quite interesting here. There does seem to have been significant amounts of seed oils in the Egyptian diet. How fascinating is that? And they had a diet that was bereft of nutrients. But thank you for this question. That's actually a really good one. It was fun to research that stuff and figure all that out. But I want to be very clear about the fact that it saddens me, it grinds my gears, that there's way too much dogma in the ketogenic community. And there's way too much associational inference, associational errors of judgment between, oh, the Egyptians had more carbohydrates in their diet, therefore carbohydrates cause chronic disease. We've seen over and over and over that is not the case when you have enough nutrients from animal meat and organs. I'm not saying make the majority of your diet carbohydrates, get nutrients from your diet, but don't get caught up in this hype and don't get dogmatic. Are ketogenic diets valuable? Yes, absolutely. And people with Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's, there's recently a meta-analysis that just showed, or it was a research study, a head-to-head -head, that showed that Ketogenic diets are very valuable for people with dementia and neurodegenerative diseases because in those diseases, there's mitochondrial dysfunction and circumventing the normal pathway used by glucose to get into the electron transport chain with ketogenesis, with ketosis is valuable. But that doesn't mean that we always need to be in ketosis all the time. And I see so much dogma in the community and it really bums me out because just because it works for some people to treat an illness doesn't mean that we should all be in ketosis all the time. I got a lot of questions when I was in Africa. Aren't you worried about getting out of ketosis when you're eating honey? The answer is no. My body works just fine. I'm metabolically healthy. I'm metabolically flexible. I can be in ketosis or not. My body can be in ketosis if it wants to be. I haven't had breakfast this morning. It's 7.44 in the morning in Costa Rica. My body's probably starting to make some ketones because my last meal was at two o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. But I'm gonna be fine. My body has the ability to both, but it's not the end of the world if you're not in ketosis. Carbohydrates are not the enemy. And I'll get Paul Mason on my podcast and have a friendly debate with him, even though he understands the importance of animal meat and organs and we agree on carbohydrates. I'll get Ken Barry on my podcast and have a friendly debate with him, but carbohydrates are not the enemy. If you are diabetic, yes, limit carbohydrates, but understand that seed oils, I believe, are the ultimate underlying culprit. There's so many podcasts I've done this. Chris Kenobi, Tucker Goodrich, Peter from Hyperlipid, understand that stuff. And also Brad Marshall from Fire in a Bottle. So many podcasts I've done on the problems with excess linoleic acid and other problems with seed oils. Humans should not be doing this. So here's my theory. I will wax poetic for a moment. I have a good friend, Jeff Nobbs, who makes amazing graphics that I've used on Rogan and otherwise. And he sent me a study about mice and changes in mouse genetics or rats genetics in response to soybean oil. You guys may have seen this. It was actually pretty scary. And 
I thought, this is interesting. There were more gene changes when there was more linoleic acid. So I still think it's quite possible that excess linoleic acid is a signal for us genetically and epigenetically. But I also can't help but wonder if there are other signals in our food. Because one of the things we know is that wheat doesn't seem to do good for humans. And whether or not wheat and organ, wheat and, excuse me, wheat and corn are the real problems, they seem to be signaling in some way. These grinding of these grains, couldn't it also perhaps signal to our bodies that there's a famine. So I wonder about the epigenetic changes that are happening with food at the level of our DNA. And I think that it's probably more complex than just linoleic acid or one nutrient affecting things at the level of mitochondria, which is quite complex to begin with. But I think that there's probably some degree of genetic signaling. The food you eat is a signal to your genetics. It's a signal to your body. When you are eating meat and organs, and this is probably a level of complexity that we're not gonna to get to for the next two or three decades with human nutrition, perhaps ever, unless these studies are funded, what sort of changes? I would love to see people look at epigenetic changes in response to food. Have someone eat meat and liver, what genes are turned on, what genes are turned off. Have someone eat rice, what genes are turned on, what genes are turned off. I bet they're different. And I bet that when you are eating things like grains, it's not signaling the right changes in your body. This is my hypothesis that the epigenetic changes in response to foods evolutionarily are unique and profound. And that wheat and rice and grains are probably not a great thing for humans, but the main, the biggest driver of these genetic changes is probably seed oils, I believe. But I don't think fruit is gonna cause a problem, but it would be interesting to test this and say, what happens if you eat fruit? What genes are turned on and off? What happens if you eat honey? What genes are turned on and off? So my point here is just on this little soliloquy ramble that I think that for most people, the food you eat is information to your genetics. Signal to your genetics that you are an abundant, successful hunter. Don't signal to your genetics that you are a crappy hunter or that you are mostly a gatherer because that will lead to unhealth and the absence of nutrients will cause problems at other levels. Signal to your genetics that you are a successful hunter by eating mostly meat and organs and the least toxic plant foods. That, I believe, is the signal you want to give your genetics. All right, on to the next question. Michael Schwartz asks, Paul, I've been hearing a lot about protein peptides such as thymus and alpha-1, ipamorelin, et cetera. These are widely used for anti-aging and hormone stimulation. These proteins are reported to tell your body to produce more growth hormone, et cetera, white blood cells, natural killer cells, et cetera. My doctor brought up thymus and alpha-1 to increase my immune system during this time. Do you have an opinion on these peptides? Yeah, I think they're very interesting, but here's the rub. They occur naturally in organs. And this is one of the coolest things I've found about organ meat and meat in general and animal foods. They contain peptides. It will not take um, too much deduction to understand where thymus and alpha-1 comes from. It comes from the thymus. So I definitely think that we should be getting these peptides from organs that we're eating. Eating nose to tail will provide you with these organs. Ipamorelin is a synthetic one, but BPC-157 occurs in the secretions of stomach lining. There's BPC-157 in our gut and digestion supplement with with tripe and intestines. There's thymus and alpha-1 in our histamine and immune supplement. There are brain peptides that will be out in our brain supplement soon. There are peptides in bones. We just released bone matrix. Bovine active in A is in bones. There are peptides in uh, colostrum, like hepatocyte growth factor. There are peptides in heart. There are peptides in liver. There are peptides in spleen, splenin, splenopentin, tufsin. This is a fascinating question. I don't think we need to be injecting these into our skin, into our butt, or taking them orally. I think evolutionarily, we should go back to what we've always done, the simplest explanation, which is get these from the foods you are eating. Eat organs. This is the importance of eating organs, even beyond getting the nutritional content of organs, which is great, choline, vitamin K2, B12, biotin, copper, zinc, manganese, strontium, calcium, and bone matrix. These are critical get the peptides from bones. Yet another reason to eat nose to tail. I love this question and I think it's really important. And I think that with all of this, we should be very careful. And repeatedly, I think we should remember that doing things that are not evolutionarily consistent usually fails. I don't wanna make an oversimplification here, but what have your ancestors always done? They've always eaten meat and organs. The hods always do this. You better believe they don't waste those organs. They sometimes give the intestines to the dogs, but not the stomach and they always eat the lung and the pancreas and the liver and the spleen and the kidneys, which is why we do what we do at Hardened Soil. And just to show you guys how much I really appreciate thymus and alpha-1 study that I've posted about before, thymus and alpha-1 reduces the mortality of severe coronavirus. What is that? 
joking. 2019, by restoration of lymphocytopenia and reversion of exhausted T cells. How cool is that? That a peptide found in the thymus, found in organs, affects our immune system. You can do it synthetically, but I think it makes a lot more sense to do it from organs, which is why I have suggested histamine and immune supplement or just getting thymus in general. If you are at risk of COVID, I wish my parents would take it. I'm gonna send my parents some histamine and immune right now, I'm thinking about it. I sent my mom some bone matrix yesterday because she has osteoporosis, but you can see here, conclusions. Thymus and alpha-1 treatments significantly reduce the mortality of severe COVID-19 patients. What, how cool is that? With counts of CD8 positive T cells or CD4 positive T cells in circulation less than 400 per microliter or 650 per microliter respectively, and they gained more benefits from TA1 when they were very immunocompromised. It reversed T cell exhaustion, recovered immune reconstitution through promoting thymus output during severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2 infection. That is why it's called histamine and immune, you guys. People sometimes ask me, what did you take when you had COVID? If you guys know, I did a whole controversial thoughts about my code experience. I was taking histamine and immune during that time, but that was the only thing I was really taking was the thymus in histamine and immune along with other immune stimulating organs like spleen, bone marrow. That's where the immune things are. There are peptides in these organs that affect us positively, that affect the immune system positively. This is the benefit of eating nose to tail. This is the magic of animal foods. And perhaps they help you grow a good beard. We'll see. The beard game is going strong right now. I'm joking about the beard, but maybe people sometimes ask me, what about hair loss? Anecdotally, there's definitely people who find that their hair loss is better on animal-based diets. Before I go on, I just wanna share a couple of cool studies about the Egyptian diet. You guys can look at these, they'll be in the show notes. Diet of ancient Egyptians inferred from stable isotope systematics. And one more. Same one, screen share another one here. Reconstructing the ancient Egyptian diet using elemental analysis. So you can look at these two, you can see the strontium to calcium ratios. These are actually very similar to what's been done with Neanderthals in the past and early Homo sapiens. And intriguingly, I've talked about these studies multiple times in the past. If you look at the diet of Homo sapiens, early Homo sapiens, coexistent with Neanderthals 50,000 years ago, they were high level carnivores. They had levels of Delta 15 nitrogen that were higher than known carnivores, meaning they were eating carnivores, that our diet was primarily animal-based and always has been just like the Hadza. You can look at that in hunter gatherers like the presumably our early ancestors. And fascinatingly, I've talked about the study in the past, Paranthropus is a species of hominid that diverged from Australopithecine and it went extinct because this was a plant eating man. So we've already done the plant-based experiment for humans. It doesn't work, that species went extinct. I'll show you guys that study because it's so cool and striking. Here's the study with Paranthropus. You can see here, we also confirm that Paranthropus robustus, sometimes called Australopithecus robustus, relied more on plant-based foodstuffs than early Homo and they went extinct. It's fascinating. They looked at strontium, calcium, barium, calcium, strontium isotopes in tooth enamel. You guys can look at that study. Again, it's linked in the show notes. And there are many studies like this that I've talked about in the past, but here is the isotopic analysis of Neanderthals. Again, these are all also in my book. Stable isotope patterns reveals diet and mobility of the last Neanderthals and first modern humans in Europe. Guess what? High level carnivores more delta 15 nitrogen than other known carnivores at the time. So fascinating stuff there in terms of the anthropology and the evolution. But you can use those same isotopes to reconstruct the diet of Egyptians, mostly plant-based. They didn't do so good for the reasons I discussed earlier. Not because they were eating excess carbohydrates. They actually had seed oils and they were nutrient deficient. Okay, on to the next question. Kent Mansley, I was watching Rhonda Patrick podcast with Jed Fahey today. They had a segment where your podcast with Joe Rogan was discussed. Do you have rebuttals to what they say about all the benefits of sulforaphane and the possible risks of cold exposure? You've both made good points and I was wondering if you had more information on the subject. So I just want to mention that I've asked, reached out to Rhonda multiple times, never responds. I respect you, Rhonda. I respect your work. It's really a bummer when she won't engage in any sort of discussion. She won't debate. She won't go head to head on this but I will give my response now and it will be a one-sided response because she never responds to me directly. She won't come on the podcast. I don't know what to say, but 
let's start with this. So forafine is an isothiocyanate produced when myrosinase combines with glucoraphanin in brassica vegetables like broccoli and broccoli sprouts. There are many isothiocyanates. There are many glucosinolates like glucoraphanin. This is clearly a plant defense mechanism. So forafane, there's zero sulforaphane in a broccoli sprout until you chew it. Zero. This is clearly, clearly a plant defense mechanism that is aimed at inhibiting the absorption of iodine to the level of your thyroid and producing all sorts of negative effects in you as a human. So forafane has been studied and the data is not convincing, but there is some very convincing data with other isothiocyanates and the impairment of iodine uptake at the level of the thyroid. So concentrations of thiocyanate and goitrin in human plasma, their precursor concentrations in brassica vegetables and associated potential risk for hypothyroidism. Radioiodine uptake to the thyroid is inhibited by 194 micromole, per micromole of goitrin, but not 77 micromole of goitrin. Collards, Brussels sprouts, and some Russian kale contain sufficient goitrin to potentially decrease iodine uptake by the thyroid. So this is the type of study that Rhonda never tells you about. It's not just sulforaphane. You're not just getting one isothiocyanate in these brassica vegetables. There are many goitrogenic substances in broccoli. There are many goitrogenic substances in kale. And if you look at all of them, it's very clear they have different abilities, different potentials, different potencies at inhibiting, at inhibiting iodine level of the thyroid. So that's the first thing, that goitrin is clearly problematic. And many of these other isothiocyanates, even beyond sulforaphane, which coexist with these in brassica vegetables, are problematic for your thyroid, among other things. In terms of other problems with thyroid, with sulforaphane, oh, I don't know. How about this one? Sulforaphane induces oxidative stress and death by a P53 independent mechanism, implication of impaired glutathione recycling. So you guys can read this study. Uh, not a good, not a good thing. Not a good thing, not what you want to be happening in your body. You do not want to impair glutathione recycling. Why does Rhonda think that sulforaphane is beneficial? Because it activates the NRF2 system, because it activates the keep two to remove, to be able to move away from NRF2 and to, I will show you guys a picture of that in a moment, and to activate NRF2 to move to the nucleus of the cell and cause transcription of genes involved in antioxidant defense. Now, there are many things that activate the NRF2 system. Cold, stress, heat, stress, exercise, ketosis does, all sorts of things activate this. So does lead, cigarette smoke. These all activate NRF2. So any oxidative stress for your body will activate NRF2, which can increase your transcription of genes involved in glutathione. But as I showed in that study, sulforaphane and some of these plant compounds, while they're activating glutathione signaling, actually impair the recycling of glutathione. This is clearly a toxic mechanism. This is not a good thing for humans. Why are you eating broccoli in the first place? If you're eating it to get more glutathione, just live a radical life like I've talked about in the past. It's much safer. You don't have all the side effects. There are effects of plant chemicals in the human body. I've talked about this multiple times. Like any chemical that we get from nature or from a pharmaceutical or from a pharmacy, it's going to have effects in your, in your body. But if I prescribe you a medication, beta blocker, statin, whatever, it's going to affect either lipid metabolism or your sympathetic nervous system, but it's going to have side effects. This is the package insert side effects that you get from the pharmacist. We are never told about the package insert side effects from these plant molecules. That is the one of the key fundamental concepts of the research, the thinking, the book, everything I've done. You cannot ignore the side effects of these plant molecules because they're real and you must balance the risks and the benefits. Sulforaphane has side effects. It has a package insert. Why would you include sulforaphane in your diet? Well, only if the risks were outweighed by the benefits, but I think they are clearly not. There is no magic in sulforaphane. You can increase your glutathione and turn on your antioxidant response genes with NRF2 easily by living well, by getting in the sun, like I'm about to go surfing, by exercising, by sprinting, by lifting weights, by occasionally fasting, by being in heat and cold stress. These are all clear ways to do this. And I've shown multiple times, you can induce glutathione with so many of these things. In fact, if we are saying sulforaphane is valuable, then we have to say that polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines from cooked meat are valuable because they do the same thing. They activate the NRF2 system in the same way. So Rhonda Patrick, I am going to choose to eat a steak rather than broccoli sprouts. I'm gonna get the exact same effect on my NRF2 system. It doesn't make any sense, right? 
With regard to meat, I don't think we should overcook it too much, but I think that these are all things that your body can handle. But there are many other bad side effects of sulforaphane, as I noted, at the level of the thyroid, impairing glutathione recycling, et cetera. This is a hugely important concept to consider. Other problems with brassica vegetables, there's evidence perhaps they're estrogenic, right? They're mimicking estrogen in the human body. Estrogenic effects of extracts from cabbage, fermented cabbage, acidified Brussels sprouts on growth and gene expression of estrogen-dependent human breast cancer cells. Yet another reason to not eat toxic plant foods. Why in the world would we go about eating plant leaves and plant seeds or broccoli sprouts that are clearly high de highly defended? These do not want to be eaten. They're not good food for humans. They're the most toxic plant foods. I've mentioned this study before. This is actually a study that shows that glutathione levels drop with whole body cold exposure and then rebound to higher than normal the next day. You can see that in this graph right here, initial boom, 60 minutes, it goes above. These are cold water swimmers right here, okay? They have higher baseline levels of glutathione than the controls. Cold water swimming, cold exposure is essentially doing the same thing as sulforaphane without the bad side effects. This is what I talked about on Rogan environmental hormesis versus molecular hormesis. I'm a fan of environmental hormesis. It activates NRF2, but it doesn't have the same side effects because it's not an exogenous foreign molecule to humans. Getting in the sun, exercise, cold, heat. These don't have the same side effects that sulforaphane and so many of these plant molecules have. This is a hugely important point that Rhonda continues to fail to appreciate. I would love to talk to her about it in person <laughs> or on the podcast send her a message. We'll get her on the podcast. We'll talk about it. This is the NRF2 keep one system that I talked about. Electrophiles, oxidative stress, all sorts of things can do this. This is a normal part of human development, normal part of human life. We shouldn't be fearful of oxidative stress. We shouldn't overdo oxidative stress. Keep one dissociates, NRF2 moves to the nucleus, turn nucleus, nucleus, turns on the antioxidant response element genes, polymerases, glutathione synthesis, reactive oxygen species control. The genes are all listed here. NADP, NADPH synthesis, et cetera, et cetera. That's the KEEP-1 system. You can activate it without eating toxic plant compounds with bad side effects. I want to share one more paper, which is good commentary. Antioxidants, myth or magic. The extrapolation of in vitro data to in vitro behavior may be misleading. For example, the physiologic relevance of pro-oxidative and other physiologic activities of antioxidants have been largely underestimated. This is the pro-oxidant things. Actually, contrary to the antioxidant hypothesis, clinical trials testing the health benefits of dietary antioxidants have reported rather mixed or negative results. Where have I heard that before? Oh, that's what I've said all the time. If you look at clinical trials looking at so-called antioxidants, they have mixed or negative results many of the times. Many of the studies looking at the benefits of fruit and vegetables show no benefit. There's no benefit here, guys. Further, oxidative stress is not only an inevitable event in a healthy human cell, but responsible for the functioning of vital metabolic processes, such as insulin signaling and erythropoietin production. Do you really want to completely abolish, to completely abrogate all of your oxidative stress? No, you don't. Taking turmeric until you're orange in the face makes no freaking sense. Putting in tons of antioxidants is a horrible idea. It doesn't work well for humans. You need these to be balanced. You need these to be balanced in your life. You don't want to abrogate all of this signaling. And taking a whole bunch of sulforaphane makes zero sense. It's clearly a plant defense chemical. So I would love to talk to Rhonda Patrick. Maybe I can get Jed Fahey on the podcast and debate him, but it's been a bummer that she's never responded. But hopefully that clarifies all that. Clear rebuttal. Um, and I'm not convinced about the negative effects of cold exposure. Don't overdo it. It's like anything. It's an environmental stressor. You can overdo it, but I think used in small doses, it's beneficial for humans. On to the next question. Golden X7. Is there a study showing excess linoleic acid is damaging for human health? I need a source of study to back up my claim against vegans. <laughs> so there are multiple studies. There are multiple interventional clinical studies. Specifically, you should look at the Minnesota Coronary Study, Sydney Diet Heart Study, and this is one of the more convincing studies that I've found and I've shared about in the past. If you guys are not subscribed to the newsletter, which is way more than a newsletter, you should do that at heartandsoil.co. I talk about many of these studies in the newsletter. You are missing out. Join the tribe. <clears throat> There's lots of good information there. Here it is, guys. This will be in the show notes. 
a high linoleic acid diet increases oxidative stress in vivo. This is in humans and affects nitric acid, nitric oxide metabolism in humans. What's so fascinating about this one and so different about many other studies that have been done with linoleic acid is that in this study, they had a saturated fat lead in, meaning they put people on high saturated fat diets before they put them on a high linoleic acid diet. The reason this is important is because I think the majority of our population is pickled with linoleic acid. And if you increase the linoleic acid in a population of people that's already pickled with linoleic acid, you're not gonna see significant changes. But in this group, and I would love to see this study repeated, when you have high saturated fat diet, which is the fat that humans are supposed to be eating a lot of as a run-in, and then you go to a high linoleic acid diet, there was a clear increase in oxidative stress markers. Urinary excretion of 8-ISO PGF2-alpha was significantly increased after the linoleic acid diet, whereas the urinary concentration of nitric, nitric oxide metabolites decreased. You don't want your nitric oxide metabolites to decrease because you want nitric oxide to dilate the blood vessels in your blood vessels to your heart, your penis, your other genital organs. These are all good things. This is why people take Viagra for sexual health. You want nitric oxide to dilate your blood vessels. This a lower nitric oxide metabolite concentration is essentially endothelial dysfunction, okay? Significant differences between linoleic acid and the control group were found for both 8-oxo PGF2 alpha, whereas the uh, oleic acid and linoleic acid did not group, did not differ with respect to any parameter. Also, plasma SICAM1 remained unchanged in both groups throughout the study. In conclusion, the high linoleic acid diet increased oxidative stress and affected endothelial function in a way which may be in the long-term predisposing to endothelial dysfunction. And that's a pretty striking study. I'm not sure how any vegan would argue with that one. Also go back to the podcasts I've done with Nina Teicholz, Brad Marshall, Peter from Hyperlipid, Chris Kenobi, Minnesota Coronary Study, etc. Lots of good studies there, guys.